Welcome. We hope you enjoy this video, which is brought to you by Take Action San Diego. If you'd like to learn more about us, please check out our website at takeactionsandiego.org. Start with Aurora Livingston, who I met at, at a Pacific Beach Democratic Club meeting and who offered her services um, to help us understand um, just what's often been a very confusing issue to me. And we know how many important bills go through the California legislature, but just aren't really sure when should we be calling, when should we be writing, um, when should we be complaining. And as a district rep for Catherine Blakespear, who is a wonderful state senator, um, she's got the insider's view. So I am going to turn it over to you, Aurora, and I will stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all. And I love seeing active members of our community engage on this topic. And so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'll just introduce myself and then I'll share my screen. Uh, I'm Aurora Livingston. I'm a district representative for State Senator Catherine Blakespear. She represents District 38 in the California State Senate. Um, I work in the San Diego District Office, which is located in Encinitas. Uh, I spend my time explaining legislation to constituents, uh, helping constituents navigate state agencies like the DMV. Um, and as far as policy is concerned, I'm primarily focused on housing and homelessness policy in the district. Um, but today, I'm going to give a brief presentation on how a bill moves through the California legislature. I come from city and county government. I've only been working uh, for the state since January. So this is something that I've been constantly researching for the past six months, trying to get my bearings on how the state works differently than local government. So this was very helpful for me. Um, and I'll answer questions at the end. Uh, and if there's anything I can't answer, we have a team up in the Capitol in Sacramento who I'm sure can answer your questions if I can't. So, but we'll see what happens. So let me share my screen. Can everybody see my title screen okay? Okay, great. All right. And it changed to the agenda slide. Okay, great. <laughs> Just always have to test out the technicalities to start. Okay, so in this presentation, um, I'm just going to introduce the senator a bit more. We'll go through the life cycle of legislation. I'll review the legislative calendar, and then I'll point out where in the process you can have the most impact. And then I'll give out my contact information and take questions at the end. And just one quick uh, note for clarification, I often go back and forth between the word legislator and member, but if I say the word member, I just am referring either to a senator or an assembly member. Um, so, great, so let's get started. Um, so, my boss is Senator Blake Spear. She is newly elected and began her first term in the state legislature in January of this year. She comes from local government as well. Uh, she served on the Encinitas City Council for two years and then was the mayor of Encinitas for six years. So getting, keeping these local connections are, is so meaningful for her. So I'm really happy to be here today. Um, District 38. Sorry about that. So District 38 stretches all along the coast of San Diego from Mission Beach up through Camp Pendleton, and then it dips into South Orange County. Um, so she represents over a million people in her district, which Mike Levin always says, you represent more people than me, uh, which is interesting. Um, so her policy priorities are um, first, addressing homelessness and building more affordable housing. Second, reducing gun violence through sensible legislation. Uh, third, um, reducing our impact and protecting the environment. And fourth, increasing accessibility to public transportation. Um, in her 2023 bill package this year, um, a few things that she's working on is she's adding language to current signage in gun stores that indicates that access to firearms increases the risk of suicide, death, and injury. You'd be surprised that gun stores don't have this language currently. Um, she's also making it easier um, for an, employee, an employer 
to file a restraining order on behalf of an employee. So Carlsbad had an employee who was being harassed by the member of the public, hundreds of phone calls a day, hundreds of emails a day. Um, and the city of Carlsbad couldn't file a restraining order against this person, even though their employee was being harassed at work. And so she's, uh, her legislation is moving to, to change that. Um, she's also trying to streamline building affordable housing on the Del Mar fairgrounds. And um, she also has another bill that requires cities to plan for homeless serving housing using their point in time count numbers. So I'm happy to provide more information on any bills that you may be interested in. So please let me know. Um, in 2024, she hopes to extend her reach in all of these policy areas. Um, we're just in the very early stages of planning for next year. So if you have any good bill ideas, we're always open. So please let me know. Okay, so now to the meat of the presentation. This is a lot of information, so try to hang in there with me. I'll try to answer any questions I can at the end. Um, so we're entering the last few months of the 2023 legislative session, but things are still moving. Um, so we'll talk about how an idea turns into a law. So step one, all legislation just starts as a good idea. And my boss actually always says, I'm in the business of good ideas. So she doesn't limit herself to where these ideas come from. They can come from an individual, they can come from a group, it can be her own idea. Um, and so you'd be surprised to know this is how laws are created. Um, so the first step is that once she agrees to do the bill, um, her staff drafts the bill language and we send it to what's called legislative council. They provide nonpartisan legal services, um, prepare a digest, and provide legal opinions. If something is totally illegal, they'll tell you, no, you can't do this. Um, if some things just need to be tweaked, they'll let you know. Um, it's a very collaborative process, and it's an amazing resource that we have at the legislature. Um, so they did, after the council looks at it, they send it back to the legislator to approve it. Um, and at this point, co-authors, um, Bill sponsors, key stakeholders may also review this language. So even before the language is printed, it can be reviewed by people who are interested in the legislation if you reach out to your legislator. Um, so then the bill is actually introduced on the floor and it's sent to the clerical portion of the legislature. The bill is assigned a number. So this is where you always hear SB5, SB8. Um, and then it is read for the first time. So step two are the committee hearings. So this is the longest part of the legislative process. Every bill first goes to the rules committee and the rules committee assigns the bill to policy committees based on the content of the bill. And so uh, a bill often go, gets assigned to more than one committee because it could have overlapping you know, housing and transportation implications. And in this case, it would go to both the housing committee as well as the transportation committee. Um, so these committees are forums that are open to the public, um, either in person or over the phone. Um, and the proposed legislation, um, you can, um, sorry, excuse me, you can have your public input at this point as well. Um, and just so you know, as a side note, committee members are assigned by the pro tem, which is our very own Tony Atkins. Um, and she also appoints the chair and the vice chair of these committees, um, but they do change pretty regularly. So this is a great time. Policy committees are a great time to contact your state, your senator or your assembly member to state your position on a bill. Um, however, it still has a long way to go and it could change significantly over time. Um, and also, unfortunately, things do get pulled off committee agendas at the last minute. But this is when district offices can really be a great resource for you. If you call me at my office, I can find out committee assignments. I can find out the dates that they're going to be heard and the times. Um, and usually it's in print four days prior to the committee hearing. So as long as four days before, we'll know when. Um, so in the committee, the member presents the legislation. Um, this is when you'll hear key stakeholders, often organizations who will testify. Um, they state their name, their organization, and whether or not they support or oppose the bill. Um, there's then questions and comments from the committee members themselves. Um, and this can be short and sweet, or it can be very, very long. Um, it just depends on the content of the bill. 
Um, there's also public comment at this stage in policy committees, but it's not like at the Board of Supervisors or at your city council where you have just one to two minutes to speak. If you have public comment, all you can do is state your name and whether you support or oppose the bill, but all of that is tracked. Um, so it's very easy. Um, you can call in a lot of the times. Some people do go in person as well. Um, so part three of the committee process is dependent on if the bill has a fiscal impact or a state cost. So if the bill has to deal with money in any way, it's going to be heard in the appropriations committee. Um, this committee is only concerned about fiscal impact and is not concerned about policy implications. They just evaluate the cost to the state. Um, it's a much more closed door process compared to policy committees. Um, there's often not public comment. You don't know which way they vote. They just release a list of whether or not the appropriations committee approved or um, denied your bill. Um, so this is kind of the process that in appropriations that we don't know much. It's purely about what happens behind closed doors. Um, and then if your bill does pass the appropriations committee, it's read for a second time. Okay, that was just step two. <laughs> so step three. The third reading is the last stage that the bill goes through in the House of Origin. So when we say the House of Origin, if it's introduced in the Senate, then the Senate is the House of Origin. If it's introduced in the Assembly, the Assembly is the House of Origin. Um, and so on the third reading, the author presents it to the entire House. And most bills require a majority vote at this point. Um, urgency measures and appropriation bills require a two thirds vote. So those are much trickier to get passed. Um, the bills then switch and go through the entire committee process all over again. Um, so if you ever wondered why we had a full-time legislature here in California, just for reference, in 2023, we had 2,600 bills introduced. Um, they die along the way, um, but for the senator, for instance, their first round is much easier than their second round because in the second round, they have to review twice as many bills that are introduced in the assembly because there's twice as many members. Um, yeah, so, and just one quick note on amendments, bills are amended throughout the entire legislative process, either in committee or on the floor. Um, so, it is published how the bill changes over time. You can look this up online so you can see how a bill's changed. Um, all right, step five. So the governor then has to sign, veto, or take no action um, within 12 days of the passage on the floor. So if the governor takes no action, the bill actually still becomes law. Um, this, again, is just because of the high number of bills that will come across his desk. Um, so in the final two weeks of session, he does have 30 days rather than 12 days because a flood of bills come in at that time. So it takes a little bit longer at the end of session. Um, if he does choose to veto a bill, the office will release a message stating why they've vetoed it. And it can be overturned, but it takes a two thirds vote in each house. Um, so also quite a difficult process if the governor vetoes your bill. Step six, if the governor signs or approves your bill, Congratulations, your bill is now a law. Um, and, but again, a bill can be approved without a signature. It's kind of odd, um, but he can just approve it without signing it. So, and the very last step is clerical. It goes to the Secretary of State um, to be chaptered, which actually literally means it's assigned a chapter. Um, so that's the number that you'll refer to it in the law from going forward instead of the bill number SB8 that you were using before. Um, so that is the process start to finish. I know it's a lot. Um, so just to go over the legislative calendar. Um, so in January, any on the first, any statutes that were um, introduced or passed in the prior year become law on January 1st, um, unless the bill specifically states otherwise, but almost always January 1st is the day. Um, within the first week of January, the legislature will reconvene for its new session. Um, so the middle of the month in February is the last day for any bills to be introduced. Um, in March, April, and May, this is the committee's amendments, committee's amendments. Um, and so, and in April, there's also a spring recess. And June 2nd, or also that was this year. So these are all this year's dates, but they tend to be around the same week. Um, the first week of June is the House of Origin deadline. 
Um, this is when the bill switch houses, remember? And um, again, there's more committees, amendments, committees, amendments in June, July, and August. So mid-September, this year, September 14th, um, is the last day for the legislature to pass bills. Um, and this is pretty typical. It's that second, second week. Um, and then there's a month to the mid-October when the governor has to sign or veto bills. And then typically November and December, members are back in their districts. Um, and this is when they'll you know, participate in community meetings, um, community events, they'll spend time with their families um, and also prepare for the next year um, and what they're gonna do in the next year with their bills. So this is probably the most important part. Um, so when can you have the most impact? I tried to mention it throughout, but first there's always ongoing outreach and coalition building between February and October. Um, this is just educating people on the current law and what the bill specifically does to change the law. Um, building coalitions, I can tell you, is essential. For instance, in homelessness policy, something that is so intersectional, we want to connect with homeless service providers um, in local government, at nonprofit organizations, um, at charitable and religious organizations, behavioral health workers, affordable housing developers. So any person or organization that the bill is going to impact, you want to be sure to reach out to have a conversation with these people um, and hopefully, you know, be able to find their support. And if not, work with them to amend the bill to garner more support. Um, so it really is quite a collaborative process. The more targeted approach um, is to express your opinion right before committee hearings and floor votes. So most bills will generate support and opposition from a variety of groups. Um, any phone call, letter you write, email you write, um, that's sent by an individual or a group is logged into a database. Um, and so in this database, the Senator reviews all constituent feedback um, before she votes on bills on the floor. Um, she of course has her principles and her core values when it comes to certain things, but with 2,600 bills, there are inevitably going to be things where she needs to know what her constituents want, because that is going to impact the way that she votes, um, because at the end of the day, her job is to represent you. Um, for submitting letters of support, um, the best time this is done is when committee hearings are coming up, um, so or before the floor vote but either one, um, but the committees, you need a bill to get past a committee to make it to the floor. So um, committees would be the most important and then the floor would be the second most important. Um, you wanna be strategic about this. So for example, if your organization focuses on gun violence prevention, your support or opposition for a bill is gonna be the most impactful prior to the public safety committee. Um, and also you have to consider the makeup of the committee which are the members Republican or are they Democrats? Do they technically support these types of bills or oppose them? Um, and this is work that I, me and my colleagues are happy to help you with as well. Um, but getting bills through committee is the hardest part. And so this is where your impact and your position is really important. Um, and just a last note on the individual level, um, a constituent is supposed to reach out only to their elected official. And because this is the person who represents you. Um, at the group level, however, if you're a group or an organization and you send a letter of opposition or support on behalf of your organization, you can send this to a member who is not your elected representative and it will be logged into the database um, and for future consideration. Um, however, if you did call you know, somebody who was outside of your district, the, they're going to ask you for your address very first, um, and a lot of times, you know, we'll take we'll take comment from people who aren't in our district, but those are the people that we want to hear from directly. Uh -huh. Okay, so my last slide is just encourage you all to follow what's going on in our office. Um, please sign up for our newsletter, um, follow us on social media, and of course, reach out to our office anytime you have comments or questions on bills. Um, and then here's my contact info directly. Um, but yeah, I can take questions from here and I'll drop some links in the chat as well. Stop sharing. Thank you, Aurora. Um, I know that was a lot of information. <laughs> no, it's exactly what 
um, I was hoping for, and I think you did it. I mean, it could could be dreary, but it wasn't dreary <laughs> at all. And I think it's exactly what we were looking for, and sort of a clearer roadmap on when are we just spinning our wheels and when are we having more impact. And um, so that's great. So I know people probably have lots of questions. I do too, but I'm going to open it up to you guys first. Um, just um, there's few enough of us, you can just raise your hand um, and I will call on you. Cindy, oh, you're muted, yeah. yeah. So um, I've heard some about a suspension file. Can you address that in terms of the process? Yes, of course. That's the appropriations committee that you're referring to. Um, so this is the process that I'm the most unfamiliar with because I was shocked to find how it's just not transparent. Um, there's a fiscal committee that anything that has to do with the state cost, they review each of these bills um, behind closed doors. And then they release what's called the suspense file. And on the suspense file is a list of the bills that have a, a fiscal impact and whether or not the fiscal community, committee approves or denies of this bill. Um, so oftentimes if something is released on suspense, that means that it's still under review for fiscal impact and most likely it will have to be reintroduced the next year or the bill is going to die. For lack of a better word, it just costs too much money for the state to implement this bill. Alrighty, and uh, Leslie wanted to know, uh, will you get a copy of the slide deck? If if that's okay with you, Aurora, I'll include that in the attachments when, when I follow up. Of course. Okay, and uh, what committees uh, does the Senator sit on? That's a great question. I have them all written down because it's so many. She's on housing, transportation, um, governance and finance, and then she's on joint uh, two joint committees as well. Oh, and she's on the fairs board as well. And then the joint committees, which is Senate and Assembly, is um, audit and climate change. And then she's also the chair of a transportation subcommittee on the Low San Rail Corridor. <laughs> So she's busy. Yeah. And and this is also from Leslie. Uh, my senator is a Republican. Suggestions. <laughs> Move. <laughs> I It kind of depends on the policy area. Um, depending on what the bill is, you could be surprised because these Republicans know that they live in, you know, California. Um, and so they... To, it depends. I wish I had a better answer than that. Um, you can reach out to uh, members outside who if you are not their constituent, um, but you know maybe you could try to convince your Republican senator that your the bill that you like is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. All right. I know I uh, have always wondered. I know that every kind of input people give is useful. Um, but is there a hierarchy? Like, is a phone call better than an email? Is a, where does letters fit in? Where do postcards fit in? As far as phone calls versus emails, no. I think they are the same because we log them into the same database. We just actually just change a dropdown letters from groups or with multiple people or from organizations, I think have maybe a little bit more weight. Um, they are reviewed by every legislator before they go to vote on the floor. Um, and, you know, it just usually groups signify are just, what's the way to explain this? A group's opinion, I don't know. It, yeah, it's weighed a, weighed a little bit heavier, I would say. So those are very useful. Makes sense. I mean, it's more people plus they're organized. <laughs> so yeah. And Raj, you had a question. Yes, I did. Thank you, Wendy. So I'm going to tag go um, 
tagging along what Wendy just asked about what has more weight. I know that the Senate committees are still taking remote uh, support or opposition calls. And I was wondering, I'm hoping that continues because that's fun. Um, I was also wondering how much impact those calls have. You mentioned something about a database. Do those also get logged? Yes, they do. And it, I think it is very helpful. Just for instance, there was a bill that was introduced by Scott Wiener this year. It was uh, SB 423. It's about like building more housing, um, you know, and it ended up extending the committee hearing. I think it was five and a half hours because so many people called in and or showed up to demonstrate their support. So I think it really does make an impact because people, re they recognize when these bills have a lot of support. Thank you, that's good to know. Appreciate yeah. it. And Becky. Yes, um, I was wondering, um, on the thing about the letters, is it better to mail them in ourselves or mail them in as a group? Um, either. I mean, as long as, you know, it's on letterhead or there's like some kind of organization name and the, like the two line or I mean the from line, um, and definitely just stating that it's an organization that represents a group of people. I think either is fine. Also to make it easier, you know, we say letter, but it can just be a PDF document that's email. So that also is very helpful. All right. Yeah, I think, you know, in this group, we have so far just written individual letters or postcards to legislators, and we have not ever as a group um, endorsed a certain position or another, you know, officially. Um, so that's something we we may want to consider doing going into this next um, session. Yeah. I think they're both extremely impactful. Um, I just know that when it's an organization, we actually log it, like it's in a separate part of the database and our legislative director goes through and says like, UMB, regional task force, people assisting the homeless, these are all the people who support your bill. Um, and it's just kind of has that extra something. Okay. Oh, I have another question. Did I hear you say something about DMV that you? That was just an example. Um, so another part of my job is just to help constituents navigate these state agencies, which are often very hard to get through to. Um, so we have a person that's called our legislative liaison. So at every state agency, including the DMV, but you know, this is the Department of Real Estate, the emergency department, any department you can think of, we have a person that we can get on the phone. So if you call me and tell me I haven't been able to fix this DMV problem for two months, it's so frustrating. I can actually reach out to someone directly for you. Um, so I was just using them as an example because okay. they seem to be one of the one of the people we reach out to the most, them and EDD as well. Okay, because um, I I have my real um, ID, but I have you know a friend or two that is having problems getting their real ID because you know they've been divorced. I mean they're women. They've been divorced and changed their names different times, and they don't have all those records. Yeah. And to me, it's kind of sexist that women have to go through this. Men don't, you know. But you know, so what what. You know, so if I had somebody that could, you know, help them out with that, that would be um, really nice to give them because, you know, it's really a problem for them to, you know, because then they can't fly anymore if they can't get a real ID. Yep. So, uh, so I'm happy to help like Senate offices or assembly offices are the perfect person to call for something like this. I dropped my email in the chat. Feel okay. free to give that to your friend. She can email me directly. Um, and if she's not a constituent of ours, um, I can directly connect her with someone from Tony Atkins district or whoever it may be. Okay, thank you. And thank you guys for listening to all that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, let's not get into DMV stories. <laughs> right. um, any other questions for Aurora? All right, then, Aurora, you've been so kind to to take uh, time out of a Saturday. I know how hard people with your kind of job work, um, and I know it's 24-7, um, so 
we really, really appreciate this. And um, the the video and the slides, I think, uh, will get distributed to our, our mailing list and our newsletter and hopefully shared with other groups as well. I think it would be enormously helpful. So thank you so much for your time and for that great presentation. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Please feel free to reach out to me. Even if she's not your member, we can figure out who is and get you talking to someone to help you. So thank you so much. Have a good rest of your Saturday. <laughs>